All right, so here we are. This is the final interview that I'm conducting with a stakeholder for the assessment on Danone, and I'm delighted to welcome Becca Morahan for this conversation today. Thank you, Becca. Thank you. Great to yeah. be here. Great to have you here, and I'm, I'm sort of excited to get us underway. As you know, I've prepared a few questions in advance of this. Um, before we jump in and get to the specifics on Danone, I'll just ask you to take a moment to introduce yourself, whatever you'd like to share about who you are and what you do. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm currently a consultant. I'm based in the UK and I have a background working. I guess my connection with this topic is that I've worked with smallholder farmers for about 20 years, um, primarily um, through co-ops. So I worked um, to begin with in kind of sourcing products from, from co-ops internationally and then also getting involved with programs to strengthen cooperatives as business entities um, and link them internationally. Um, and then I, in the last 10 years or so, I've had a particular focus on, on women farmers and women in farming households and how they can be empowered and integrated into co-ops and receive more value from agriculture. Um, and I, yeah, I think as we've spoken about before, I feel like I'm in a bit of a transition. So I'm, I'm reflecting a bit um, on kind of my role going forward, but so far it's been about working with teams and with businesses to help them to think through issues of equity and inclusion and inclusion of women and put into practice um, ways of including women and ways of consulting with them and benefiting them. So yeah, it's been a mainly a focus on tree crop agriculture, so coffee and cocoa and nuts and tropical agriculture. Um, although recently I've been doing a little bit of work with the Sustainable Food Trust, so sort of starting to take that broader view of looking at what's happening in the UK as well. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think I'm, I'm in, yeah, in a quite a reflective emergent space. I feel almost like my responses will probably re reflect my experience, but also some things that I've been reading and thinking about more about the future. So in a bit of an in-between space. Perfect. I feel like we're all kind of in some kind of liminal goo right about now. So this yeah. is a good time. <laughs> And uh, just to clarify, um, as I do with all these interviews, do you have any commercial relationship or background with Denon that we should know about? No, I don't. I've not worked with them. No, just consume their products sometimes. Cool. Yeah. Okay. And likewise, I always disclose how I am connected to the stakeholders that I interview. So I feel like I'm very fortunate to have recently been connected with you. We haven't worked together, but I think of us as sort of peers and friends out in the world. And we were connected through a common, uh, common colleague of ours who uh, made it possible for us to be in touch. So this is kind of early days of our own conversations, which I'm very grateful for. Yeah, me too. Yeah, cool. And I'll also just preface um, something we chatted about briefly before, and I think it's particularly important for this conversation, that although we're talking about Danone, um, this is also a conversation about the food system more broadly. So there may be times where your responses are specific to the company or not, and that's okay. And we'll just be as clear as we can as we go. Um, and the fact that you have so much direct experience working with smallholder farmers, which is a big part of Danone's disclosures, uh, and of course of the food system more broadly, um, I think your experience generally with smallholder farmers and looking at the gender piece is, is such a key element of this conversation. So that's what made me think you'd be a really great, um, really great mind to share in this process. So thanks for making yourself available. Great, thank you. Yeah, so let's jump in. And just before we go into the Danone specific conversations uh, and questions, I'd love to hear in your own words, what is the future you want? And I, I just want to clarify before I let you fill in the blanks um, that we, we bump into so much jargon in the sustainability and environmental, social and governance or ESG world. So many different terms and phrases that get thrown around. I think it's really important to understand what you as an external stakeholder describe as the future you want in your own language. Mm, thank you. Yeah, it was really interesting reflecting on this question. Um, and I think it's informed by, by some things that I'm reading at the moment, um, which I hope it's okay to mention, but I'm in the middle of reading an extraordinary book called Hospicing Modernity. Oh yes, um, yeah. more than okay to but, mention. Bring yeah, it. Vanessa Andriotti. And, I think it's that's percolating. So um, the first thing that came to mind when I asked myself this question was just some kind of concepts or words 
And it's something I've been thinking about recently, which is, and the words that came to mind was joyful reparation mm -hmm. and clear sightedness. Those were the two things I wanted to speak to a bit, because I think, I think, yeah, the framing of work, broadly speaking, on sustainable agriculture, regenerative agriculture, I think for me can still be framed as sort of something good that companies are choosing to do, you know, and, and obviously they are to be applauded, but I, I just have this sense of there being a really important piece that I feel we need to, to tend to in order to move forward, which is a, is a kind of clear sightedness about the harms that have been done, both ecologically and both in terms of, you know, north-south relations or relations between, you know, colonizing countries and colonized countries, for example. Um, because I think, yeah, these international food systems are, you know, take place within this context. And yeah, there's a sense I feel of really needing to to see it clearly and and yeah somehow to make amends that's where I'm coming from I feel like this sense of what if we frame sustainability as reparation what if we framed it as just simply the right thing you know the right thing to do having seen what's been extracted or having seen what's been thrown into imbalance you know there is a need to to write those things and I think um yeah the other thing that came to mind was just all of us having the future I want is for all of us to have more capacity, you know, for reflection and for seeing ourselves as part of that broader system and not standing outside it, you know, that there, we all have a part, you know, we've all played a part and we all have a part to play in changing things. And um, there's a line I was reading just yesterday, actually, around none of us being indispensable, but all of us being needed or something like that, like mm -hmm. this idea that, yeah, and that we all have to work together. So I think the other piece for the future for me is just you know, everything I feel has to be based on a recognition of our interdependence and yeah, just that we can't, we can't sort of see issues and, you know, in isolation and we can't see, um, yeah, future solutions in isolation somehow. So sort of the ability to, to recognize complexity and, and to recognize our interdependence. Um, and I think specifically with food, I, I think my response for sort of the future of food systems feels rooted in particular experiences I've had where I've visited particular farms or co-ops and I've just had this sense in my being of like ah oh, this is what we need more of you know? so when I think about it I think about a particular co-op in Kerala the Fair Trade Alliance Kerala where they've had this strategy to like a three-pronged focus of gender equality biodiversity and food security and they are deliberately rewilding their farms and they're looking mm -hmm. at permaculture and how you grow food in a way that's sort of and you you know they've, they've got a seed festival every year where they bring back kind of foods that they used to eat and and sort of promote their consumption and there was something so alive and so vibrant when I visited I was like oh this there's something you guys are onto that I want to see more of um and I feel the same about a co-op I visited for many years in Peru, where slightly from a slightly different perspective, they were also practicing organic agriculture, but they had such a strong sense of kind of social purpose. And mm -hmm. I remember talking to one farmer who, through the experience of organizing with other farmers and being part of this cooperative, um, he had then gone on to bring electricity to his community. And there was this sense of like, what happens when people come together and have that real sense of togetherness and possibility? And, so somehow I feel very formed, I think, by those experiences. Um, so yeah, something around definitely, you know, I mean, regenerative agriculture is one of those terms that I think can be very open to interpretation, but um, mm -hmm. somehow it's the combination of the regenerative practices, but also the recognition of needing to, yeah, needing new forms of organization or old forms of organization, such as co-ops, but that social justice inclusion piece. And, and then I think us in the North needing to just do a lot of, yeah, sort of introspection and, and getting clear and making amends mm. <laughs> in a nutshell, mm. I think. Yeah, those are the elements that came to mind. I love it. That's a really beautiful bundle to bring into our future. Thank you very much. And that that notion of joyful reparation. I think the timing of this conversation is a really good one. So thank you for planting those seeds. Um, and if you can hold that future vision as a lens through which to look at the questions I'm about to, to bring to you so that that's sort of what we're aspiring towards as we go through these questions. Um, and 
let's begin uh, thinking, so now going specifically into the company of Danone and thinking specifically about the positive impacts. And here you can be as, as specific as you like. So let us know if this is something where you're actually directly reflecting on something that you know about Danone or if you're more considering the, the food industry or what you've seen happening out there. And that'll, that'll um, clarify your remarks. And as much as possible, talking about the positive impacts, positive activities that from your perspective actually contribute to that future you just described. What do you see happening? What would be evidence of that in as much detail as you can give? Sure. No, I was, I was really, I mean, pleasantly surprised, I think, looking at their materials, because I don't know the company well, and I don't I have a little bit of experience in dairy supply chains, for example, but it's not an area of expertise. But I, a few things jumped out at me reading their materials. I think one was they described having close and long-term relationships with farmers. So there's something about that word relationship that really struck me. I think it reminded me of this, of an organization I worked with for many years um, called Twin and Twin Trading. And that was an, a tenet of how we worked was this idea of kind of being together through thick and thin, forming human relationships somehow in the face of what can feel quite a sort of faceless global trade. Um, and then they, they coupled that description of relationships with also saying that they they don't use the kind of conventional price setting mechanisms. I don't know whether that would be the you know, global markets. I mean, I know more about how coffee and co cocoa price, but that they have a commitment to, to paying prices which cover the cost of production. So that jumped out at me because I feel that that you know, definitely has gained traction as an area of focus in recent years. But for a while, it felt like it was the piece that was missing from the conversation. You know, there was a lot mm -hmm. of elsewhere, I have to say on their website, I saw that they talked about how you know, the main challenge of smallholders is around sort of, you know, not having the technical understanding or the soil health, you know, in order to have the livelihoods that they needed. And I was like, price is missing there. You know, you need to sort of, so it sort of appeared in one place and not in the other. But I think that it, it mm. came right at the sort of top of how they described how they work with their suppliers, this idea of having these long-term relationships and paying, paying the right price. So that really, I thought was really positive. And I think, yeah, I think that's in a sense, the biggest responsibility I would say of, as, you know, consuming companies, consuming buying companies and consuming countries is is to pay the right price um and i think the other yeah i think the focus on soil health i mean i'm not a regenerative agriculture expert but i know from the experts that i've worked with that's absolutely key to to you know regenerative farming and so i think that coupled with the transparency of their resources like so i saw like an open source resource on soil health and um so I definitely got a sense of them wanting to kind of share knowledge and um, yeah, focus on the right things, I would say. Um, I felt a bit less clear maybe about, yeah, about some of the other aspects, which I know will come to the next question, but I, that one, yeah, stood out very positively. Um, and then I kind of, yeah, I felt like I had to dig a little bit more to go into some of maybe some of the social issues and, and I guess, yeah um some things i kind of couldn't see evidence of like for example working with co-ops or kind of structural side i couldn't really see much of but but i actually had a really positive view looking at these these funds that they work through to invest in agriculture so the ecosystem fund and the livelihood fund and the communities fund i again felt like um we're pointing to really interesting things and i think they you know they and the livelihood fund page they there was i made a note of it said that we're convinced that the best farming techniques are those that are inspired by the workings of nature itself and there was a kind of explicit recognition on that page around the effects of intensive agriculture and monocropping which again I don't feel like I've seen stated quite so clearly on you know because I, I feel like probably there's a lot of supply chains which do have you know some palm oil in the mix or you know the, the crops that are kind of classically farmed very intensively um so I think that yeah that was really great to see just this sort of recognition yeah that um i guess for me that if i think about farming techniques inspired by nature i would think about things like permaculture and you know those working mm -hmm. with the natural environment rather than against it and that reminds me of the farms that i saw in kerala um so that i thought was really positive and yeah and i and, and i was just i'm just was reading this afternoon a paper they produced on on their work with women which obviously is a lens that i'm always kind of looking mm -hmm. out for mm -hmm. and that also actually seemed really interesting. I mean, I, I liked the way they put the report together that they, um, there was kind of multiple voices in it and, and um, an acknowledgement of that there isn't one fixed definition of women's empowerment, for example. And there was even one contributor who said actually, 
we need to stop talking about empowering women, you know, which is the kind of critique, which is quite reassuring to see as someone who works in the sector, because it's like, yeah, you're right, you know, it's talking about, it's just sort of creating the conditions where women can empower themselves. I mean, perhaps you're, you know, it's a semantic thing, but it, it felt like a robust publication, actually, and an interesting mm -hmm. publication, and it was talking, it used the word experts, I think, to describe kind of, I think I understood that the experts they were, they were consulting were you know, women with lived experience, you know, who mm -hmm. are part of the projects and everything. So I think, um, yeah, those things really stood out. And also interesting that, to see that they're sourcing ingredients locally for some of their products. I thought that was interesting. I think this, yeah, it, it kind of got me thinking, I think because I always think of France as being someone with a particular sensibility around agriculture and a particular value that's given somehow to farming and food production. It felt like I could sense that somehow in their literature mm -hmm. and and it was interesting to see that you know beneficiaries in France alongside in sub-Saharan Africa which is where you normally see these sort of benefits of beneficiaries of this kind of investment and it was kind of nice to see them next to each other um because I think yeah my original kind of interest in agriculture was kind of around the time of the WTO protests and just that sense of kind of how insane our food systems are you know the amount of food that kind of gets moved from places and so yeah just I, I I would definitely be yeah view that positively the idea of sourcing ingredients locally um and they use the for in the ecosystem page they use the phrase disruptive business models so my which which sparked interest because <laughs> I feel like that's definitely I don't know I didn't get a clear sense exactly of what was meant I think it was kind of yeah um sort of market-based sort of solutions I think to yeah. and that was in relation I think to women um so yeah I think those all of those things um I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I that I saw um yeah I think those are the main things that's great thank you I really appreciate the the depth of your taking a close look especially given your experience on the ground um let's flip the coin a little, recognizing there's work to be done. And when you think about that future you want, are you aware of any concerns, activities, impacts that might be undermining that future? And what sort of evidence or examples might you describe there? Yeah, I don't think I, I was looking out for things and I kind of, and there weren't really any red flags, I would say. I'd say they were there were gaps, maybe, kind of mm. sort of mysteries. <laughs> <laughs> sort of things I was like I don't know if I have a clear sense of this um do you want to I say a bit more I was, yeah I, I, a couple I mean I I was interested that when I so they talk about empowering the future generations but when one follows those links it takes you to more information about um, regenerative farming practices which obviously is a huge part of the future but I guess I was missing I think because I'm so aware and again I don't know how particular this is to tree crop agriculture but you know the co-ops I've been working with the average age is sort of 50 to 70 the farmers and there's this huge question about the future of farming and how how to engage young people and how to um yeah how to stop that kind of mass emigration to the cities essentially when mm -hmm. when it's difficult to you know there aren't so many rural job opportunities um and so I think there's really interesting work happening in that area of that kind of middle ground where ambitious young people want to get involved, but they don't have the land, for example. And mm -hmm. so I think that, you know, I know of some fantastic initiatives by co-ops, particularly in Latin America, in Nicaragua and Peru, where they've really thought through, you know, one in Nicaragua, they incredible, they, they start right with this vision of they sponsor kids, you know, at, at kind of primary school level, and they have this close relationship with families the whole way through. And then kids graduate and they end up working as technical staff at the co-op or something. So there's something, there's that kind of real sort of deep relationship with families. And so I was missing a little bit of that, I think, when they talked about future generations, I was like, oh, what are they doing to engage with young people? And then I was like, oh, I can't see anything. It kind of took yeah. me back to the more technical aspects of kind of, in, yeah. So, Interesting. and I think the same potentially with, with women that I, there was very clear accounts, you know, of the project work, but I think I'm always looking for kind of what's not, what's going on behind the scenes in terms of um, women's labor, women's ownership. I wasn't totally clear how integrated it was in terms of their sourcing, for example. So I think, you know, there was acknowledgement in one of, the, I was reading, just skim reading the paper about their projects. There was acknowledgement that when, 
when you invest in, an, in a particular area of agricultural activity, sometimes one of the impacts can be that women lose control over it because men start to get more interested in it because they see that it's kind of income generating. And it just reminded me a bit of, I was doing some work in Northern Nigeria and the idea, you know, men owned the cows, but women owned the milk and their livelihood was about selling the milk. And one of the initiatives they wanted to implement was to sort of professionalize it and have everything happen through these milking parlors. But then the kind of the milk then ended up by default belonging to the men. And, you know, there was all sorts of things that you were like, oh, hang on a second. You know, so mm. I just wonder to what extent they're looking at all of their investment through this gender lens, because I think particularly with the future of food production, you know, women, I think you, the kind of classic scenario in a sense is the cash crop, which is controlled by men or the kind of primary agricultural activity is invested in. And then behind the scenes, women with kind of marginal bits of land um, mm. are kind of producing food, often, you know, holding on to seeds and, you know, kind of ho holders of kind of local agricultural knowledge, but they're sort of under invested in, I suppose. So I'm just, mm. yeah, I think I definitely, I, I, I don't feel qualified to kind of comment. I'm just at like a very initial review. I was just interested to see like where the work on gender shows up, because I think it often yeah. shows up on the project side and not so much as a kind of integrated part of their sourcing. Um, yeah, I think those, and I guess, yeah, this question around price and relationships. Um, I was just, yeah, interested. It just got me thinking again about the structures that they buy through. Like I, I quite like to be able to see, like when I look, clicked on like who their suppliers were, I got that sense of quite a lot of kind of in, slightly unfamiliar names of sort of intermediary companies. And I was like, oh, mm. it'd be really nice to see a supply chain, you know, to sort of get the sense of, because yeah. I'm kind of interested in supply chain governance and, and who gets to, you know, how far farmers can negotiate on price, for example. And yeah, um, yeah. and and because I, I suppose I feel like, yeah, there's it, the reason I've, I'm passionate about co-ops as businesses is just this idea that, yeah, farmers can, can come together and can be a can be a negotiating partner, you know, in supply yeah. chains and don't just have to be price takers. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think those areas really, yeah. Yeah, those are helpful gaps. And I'll just do a little dot connecting across interviews, especially because I was just in the editing trenches on the one with uh, Fabricio Moriana, who does a lot of sort of south-south food system work. And one of the things he raised was the opportunity for a much more uh, sort of radical transparency approach, which some of the producers he works with are already practicing producers and retailers. So I'll just make that little connection. And I, and as I'm editing, I'll, I'll connect to that video in this video. So, um, but I'll keep us moving forward here and I'm going to do a little screen sharing, I think. So tell me if you see a slide with your name on it and a grid. Oh yes. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. So I'll just quickly set this up and I'll ask you to humor what I routinely describe as a completely absurd exercise that is totally unsuited to the purpose of diagnosing anything in a dynamic complex system. But nonetheless, it's helpful to hear what you would say in response. So it's more about your explanation than the actual number. This is a classic two by two matrix. The vertical axis is meant to articulate the health of the ecosystem. Everything above the horizontal line is the ecosystem getting healthier. Everything below it is being undermined or damaged in some way. The horizontal axis is looking at the health of society or people within that ecosystem. Anything to the left of the line, we're seeing damage undermining to societal health. Anything to the right of the line, we're seeing people getting healthier, being well, and perhaps moving towards that future you described. So in other words, upper right hand quadrant, we are getting ever healthier, lower right hand, uh, sorry, lower left hand, we are experiencing an undermining, uh, undermining state of our overall health. And so what I would ask you to do, based on your understanding of the company, and your vision of the future, I would ask you to tell me where you think I should place this bubble that represents the company. Mm. It's an interesting one. I feel I'm sort of feeling I'm feeling it's on a, on the plus side on both. I mean, mm -hmm. judging 
by what I've read on other company websites, I'm I'm impressed. I'm sort of think I'm feeling kind of three above on on both axes. So that yeah, that's mm-hmm. what I'm feeling. There. I feel yeah. like I sort of lack information to go any further. I feel there's mm-hmm. yeah, there's only so much transparency and so much that's said about both. But yeah, I am. Yeah. Um, I think the thing that makes me think plus three on in terms of ecosystems is is this clear acknowledgement of the limitations and the and the harm of intensive agriculture and this commitment in particular the the level of detail that's provided on the soil health aspect and yeah I think I, I I haven't seen something quite that clear on a company not that I've been trawling through company websites but I but I feel Sometimes I think one can hide between, as you say, behind the jargon of sustainability. Mm-hmm. And again, you feel like, what do you really mean by that? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, yeah, the, the the societal health, I guess I feel that there is a stated commitment to, to that. I think even in their mission statement, isn't there, around food mm-hmm. and health mm-hmm. and well-being, um, which again, I think is would pushes the score up for me because I think obviously yeah. they're looking explicitly at aspects of nutrition and maternal health and mm. you know first thousand days and you know elderly care and so I think there is this kind of health emphasis I think that's probably what's pushed it up for me I think where you'd say impact on societal justice I'd probably <laughs> a bit lower because I don't feel like I can see that sort of evidence yeah. necessarily of addressing perhaps kind of yeah supply chain governance or um I mean, there's poverty alleviation in there, isn't there? But yeah, I, I think the health, I would say, yeah, They're I, doing I have a positive thing. view of actually having read their, their nice. materials. Yeah. Now, because I get to sit here and do these interviews, and because <laughs> I'm in the um, luxurious spot of having had other conversations, and because off the top you mentioned you're reading Hospicing Modernity, which is you know hot off the press, and I think sort of the next phase of sustainability and and you I think rightly call out like wouldn't it be something if that reparation mentality was actually what we're doing in sustainability I'm gonna just check how you feel about and please there's no right or wrong answer here this is all about the discussion not the diagnosis um but given that one of the the first thing you led with in the future you want was joyful reparation Yes. I wonder how you less, you know, comparing to what other companies are doing and more comparing to the future you want. Do you see the placement differently with that in mind? And I would so actually. And, yeah. yeah so and I think this think? is this is my challenge a little bit with um mm-hmm. I think just on a very personal level, feeling feeling quite in between different perceptions of this work. And I I think um just again to quote the book, um Vanessa Andriotti talked about having a simultaneous deep respect and sort of deep suspicion (laughs) together of sort of existing solutions. You know, she was talking about it in response to kind of movements, defined movements, eco-feminism, whatever it is. And I had that slight sense with Danone as well. And even even with my own response to it, I was like, this all sounds great. And at the same Mm -hmm. time, I'm sort of deeply suspicious of all of it because it feels like it's part of a current paradigm that needs to change at a much much deeper level and um so I think it's almost like yeah seen through the sort of lens of the existing paradigm and so I think what the book talks about is kind of it's not that we should throw these solutions out the window because they are useful for harm reduction in the short term while also acknowledging you know their limitations and that and that the answers are not going to anything that in a sense is functioning within the current system in a sense, yeah, is part of what needs to change, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Or one has to be kind of critical or suspicious of it because it's like, well, so yeah, in that sense, I think, um, no, I, and I, I, I suppose that's, yeah, if one looks at it through that frame, like, we'd probably be below the line on, oh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so um, and it's, it's your call. Um, yeah. If you think it's fine to be left here, I will leave it here. If you no, like I'd, I'd sort of put it just under. Rest. Maybe I'd put it maybe mine, sort of minus one and a half, probably on both or something. Because I, I sort of yeah. feel a bit mean, kind of putting because <laughs> I feel within the current paradigm, I feel like there's quite a lot to celebrate, and and that feels yeah. important to acknowledge. Um, yeah, 
but it feels like there's some potential there if they have these close relationships I sort of feel like oh wow there's the potential for something more radical there's that's yeah. kind of what I'm wondering yeah. um like because even the way they they were talking about that I think they had some of their staff members go and assist on projects a bit like a VSO type model mm -hmm. and I started reading I was listening to one of the interviews and and I thought I was like, and they did some of them spoke to kind of what it had been for them as an experience. But I was thinking, oh, you could frame this in on its head, you know, you could frame yeah. it as a yeah, as a development program for staff to understand more about the real, you know, so rather than it being we're going out with our expertise, you know. So that felt a right. bit kind of old mindsets, yes, which you know yes. I've been part of as well. But that's definitely what I'm wrestling with. Um what's needed. So yeah, sort of levels of introspection or reflection I don't know on colonial legacy I don't know if it's clearer perhaps with things like coffee and cocoa and tea than it is with dairy um yeah some of you know I know they're working in the US in Europe it's it's maybe it's mm. different paradigms that they're working with where they that with that particular frame it doesn't feel so immediately kind of urgently <laughs> needed yeah. as it does in the sectors I've been working in but yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks for humoring that rethink. And I will yeah. stop sharing my screen here and I'll I'll press this forward a bit just knowing uh, I don't get to keep you all day. Um, <laughs> but I really, really appreciate that. And actually, it's a good segue into where we'll go next. So we're the last couple of questions are kind of scenario oriented. Um, and I'm going to take us into a, a headline that I just got. So very excited to have uh, received this news, breaking news, which is that you are in charge of everything. The whole universe, nothing's in the way. Whatever you would like to see happening is what happens. And so, with that in mind, what changes would you make to Danone? Gosh, yeah, this is where I feel like, gosh, I don't, you know, I don't know enough about the conversations that are happening internally. I think where my interest lies, and I guess this is kind of quite a personal response, is um, I'm deeply interested in what needs to change in us. And when I say us, I think I'm talking broadly global north people situated in these kind of companies i i feel drawn to and interested in what are the questions we need to ask ourselves so how so i think still within these food system conversations i feel like we can default to this lens of kind of zooming in on what the farmers doing and are they fulfilling certain standards you know so that they can be one of our suppliers and I feel like I just want to sort of almost turn the lens on us and be like, what what do we really need to be understanding and knowing about ourselves in quite a personal way, actually, you know, our own motivations, our attachments, um, our ways of seeing the world. Um, I feel interested in like, how could I contribute? So if I was in charge, I, I'd, I'd somehow create an opportunity again, um, joyfully, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> too painfully and that's why I really appreciate the, the book you know the Hospice Modernity book because she talks about the ways in you know the way she uses metaphor or you know the way she kind of engages people with these quite difficult topics of kind of having to look within but I think I'm just I just have this sense of really needing to kind of shift paradigms and somehow I don't really know what I'm reaching for but there's some sense of um yeah, just needing to really take a step back from from the ways of thinking that we're currently operating in, the structures we're operating in, the motivations, um, the power dynamics, and and yeah, I don't know. Have, I don't know whether it would lead to anything, but yeah, some, something about being willing to be uncomfortable and and to sort of say, is there more we could be doing? Could we be more radical? Could we could mm -hmm. we push? Or some awful phrases, push the envelope or think outside the box, <laughs> even more, you know, beyond yep. what we're doing. Um, where are our blind spots? And mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I'm kind of interested, I suppose I'm always interested in kind of innovations or disruptions, or I was thinking about, for example, the organization We Farm, where it's very much about peer-to-peer -peer farmer learning rather than that, that sort of expertise yeah. assessment happening from the north to the south. So, you know, is there room for more of that? Um, yeah, so um, is there room to kind of, I don't know, make the farmers the shareholders or, you know, what, what are those sort of more mm -hmm. kind of bolder things that one could do? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
Well, it turns out it was it was fake news. It was not a real headline. Um, although I like the idea of you being in charge of everything, um, but I just received a new um, a bit of information. So a new scenario to drop us into, where you can maybe continue some of your uh, Queen of the Universe efforts. In that, um, it turns out that you have the ear of the CEO. It's a different CEO from when I started doing these interviews. So it's now Antoine de Saint Afrique. And although he's very busy, he takes your calls. He wants to know what you have to say. And in this instance, you've got 30 seconds to tell him what you might like to see him doing differently at the company. Mm. Um, yeah, <laughs> I spent 30 seconds on being narring. I think, um, I don't know. I feel inspired by this conversation, actually. I feel, I feel like this exercise of what's the future you want and how is your company, you know, in a sense, it's the questions you're posing, actually, because there's something about that, you know, this, and I think this is what you're doing with these materiality assessments. There's something about, I think when you're in a world um, that has its own reference points, one can be, you know, doing well against those reference points, but there's something mm -hmm. so powerful about saying, what's the future you want? And then how are you doing in, you know, in comparison to that future? So I think I probably would, yeah, ask them something along those lines. And yeah, um, I mean, I, you know, I have specific questions always about, you know, how I think my passion is, is really having that kind of recognition of farming as a family endeavor and, and, mm -hmm. you know, what are you really doing to, to kind of recognize the unpaid contribution of women and to empower young people to, to take a step forward. But that feels like quite a narrow lens. And I think that just comes from my you know particular area of interest. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think just as a broader topic, if I had 30 seconds, I think, yeah, it, it, I think it would be that, um, I guess, just what's the future you want? And, you know, is there and, and how could you be more radical? And how could you how could you because I have a sense that they are leading um, mm -hmm. already mm -hmm. and, and that there's something about building on that leadership um, to go to go even further. Um, yeah, yeah. That, that 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 role like really embracing that role of like yeah urgent you know there is an urgency isn't there about about these things and yeah what how could you so you know go beyond even what you think is possible to mm -hmm. yeah to change things yeah I don't know it doesn't feel like very articulate 30 seconds but yeah. no I love it I mean the, that's the joy of scenarios is we get to play and you know, a couple things really strike me one is that when I think back to a few minutes ago when you were placing the bubble and then when you reoriented around really the future you want versus comparing them in relation to others, you brought them back into the paradigm of where we are now with a call to step out of it. And I wonder, I, I quite legitimately wonder, it's a big part of what prompts me to do this, you know, what does it look and feel like when a large leader genuinely steps out of the paradigm I don't have an answer to that um and then the other thing that strikes me in this I swear you know to the three people who might listen to this I swear this was not a plant but I feel like in a way you just said in your 30 seconds like hey CEO of one of the world's biggest food companies you really need to do a reality-based materiality assessment <laughs> so hopefully they're paying attention it's all free open source they don't they don't need us although hopefully they'll they'll give you a call and get and get a hand um all to say thank you. It's a it's a really thoughtful answer. Um, and and that was the last of my prepared questions for you. So the only other question I would ask is: Is there anything I didn't ask you about that you feel would be important to consider as we imagine Denon into the future we want? Mm. I think I think I think the piece I'm thinking of often is um, farmers farmers as consume, you know, as producers of their own food and consumers of their own food, I think there's something around, um, which I think, you know, I think they do have that holistic view, but yeah, I'm just, I get, I get a little bit worried by this kind of emphasis on farmers as, as suppliers or as producers only. And I, I sort of always want to sort of broaden that view and yeah, what would it look like to really commit to certain principles, which, you know, again, move, maybe move into sort of slightly political territory for big companies like food sovereignty, um, really supporting farmers to 
and I, and I, I sensed their gesturing towards this actually, which gave me a lot of hope actually, because I think they even mentioned explicitly that, that the kind of monocropping and the intensive agriculture has meant dependence on, I think they use a phrase dependence on technical inputs, but um, mm. I think it requires a kind of discipline as, a, as, a, as an investor and as a business not to be completely oriented by, you know, your needs as a, as a, a buyer of those products, you know, so. Right. Yeah, there's something there, that piece around food sovereignty and around farmers really being able to, to feed themselves, first and foremost, and, and to be supported, you know, in that way of life. Um, yeah, I, I just feel like I've seen so many in, investment scenarios that are, in fact, promoting an agenda that's to do with the input companies and the technical assistance. And, you know, and, I, and so much agricultural investment feels to me disempowering for farmers. So there's something yeah. around... Yeah, I feel like as a food company who have this holistic view, you know, who are interested in health and well-being, there's a quite an exciting potential for a company like Danone to really get behind, you know, some of those asks mm -hmm. of Via Campesina or, you know, those kind of more radical organizations. Because mm -hmm. um, there's such a split, it feels like, between the kind of corporate, you know, as you say, the sort of slightly demonized corporate agenda and then the kind of passionate farmer movements. And I'm always interested in like, how do we find them? meeting point for these to yeah. talk to each other you know and I do feel like a company like Danone from what I've read and again very limited yeah would it be interesting to to really listen at least you know to to kind of take on board um yeah the, this kind of more holistic view of farmers as citizens and and as consumers and growers of, of their own food um and to think about what they need not just as suppliers of global supply chains yeah yeah, that's great. I'm glad you raised that. I feel like that's connected to this big, you know, it's it's ridiculous that it's an aha, but it's definitely a, an aha in the global north, this notion of not centering the global north, <laughs> you know, or not centering the sort of capitalist entity, but rather centering those where, um, well, those who are the source of the things that we are taking and or the, those who are supposedly having their needs needs met <laughs> this notion of centering it's like a, a low level spiritual maturity that i think we're, we're slowly uh, slouching towards all to say becca thank you so much for your time and your expertise and your knowledge i really appreciate it um unless you've got any uh parting words or calls to action I can I can give you back your afternoon any any final thoughts for anybody listening in oh I think um no I think I think just it's like a it's like a continual self-discipline isn't it as you say mm -hmm. to to come out of that centering and you know systems have edges and the system is I, I as I understand it, the system is always trying to protect itself and remain integral to itself so I think it's about finding like where where's the edge of the system where can we sort of you know edit out and I what's coming to mind just from your last comment is just yeah like how do we really ground ourselves in those realities you know what are the practices that really enables us to do that and I just brings to mind a project that um I didn't work on directly but I was part of the organization which was a project in Peru um with you know companies that were involved Marks and Spencer's quite a well-known company Matthew Algae um Taylors of Harrogate you know quite big companies and they really I felt really successfully grounded their investment in in a real in a listening exercise that kind of real like what do you need and there was a you know there was visioning using visual tools about the real climate impacts locally you know the issues that were really important to those farmers and I I know it's a small scale thing and it's not always possible but I somehow feel that yeah we need to recognize that the system we're in the system and it's always going to push us you know to separation and and as you say centering ourselves and so I feel like for me, it's about, you know, what are those practices? What are those ways of working mm -hmm. that, yeah, that will help us just keep on, you know, because I found even working for an organization that was explicitly trying to um, work, you know, in a more cooperative way. Um, if I didn't go <laughs> there or I didn't have some personal interaction with someone from a farming community, I could feel my thinking started to go into like, oh, mm -hmm. the company that I'm supplying and what their needs are, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's something around sort of, it's not, you know, it's not our, it's not an individual person's fault. I, I just feel like that's what systems do, don't they? They sort yeah. of yeah. try and stay intact. So, yeah, it's great. Disruptive practices. Disruptive feels like a helpful word. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Disruptively yeah. moving towards joyful reparations. Yeah. <laughs> 
amazing. <laughs> good um, name for an autobiography. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Becca Morhan, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate your time. Cheers. Thank you.